Amendment 3 to a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and, so and Human Services to the Metro Board of Health to prepare, prevent, and respond to COVID-19 as needs evolve for clients of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients. RS-2021-914 by Toombs, Taylor, and others accepts a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to the Metro Board of Health to provide for the prevention, surveillance, diagnosis, and treatment of HIV, HIV AIDS and administer a minority AIDS initiative program. RS-2021-915 by Toombs, Taylor, and others accepts a data across sector for health dash grant from the Metro Interdenominational Church to the Metro Board of Health to support the development of multi-sector collaborations and support staff particip participation in the mentor program for the Nashville Prep Coalition. RS-2021-916 by Toombs, Taylor, and others accepts an in-kind grant from the Center for Nonprofit Management to the Metro Board of Health to provide consulting support to strengthen relationships and alignments for ending the HIV epidemic, EHE. And our final resolution is RS-2021-917 by Toombs, Taylor, Swore, and Welsh approves Amendment 1 to a grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to achieve sustained tubercul tuberculosis control and enhance tuberculosis prevention to eventually eliminate tuberculosis as public health threat in Tennessee. Do I have a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Mr. Sharp. Uh, Mr. Chairman, both of these are fairly standard. 13. Uh, Amendment 1 is fairly standard. There's no money attached to that one. I believe that's one of those instances where they're giving us more time to spend money that they've granted us for the COVID Ryan White program. Uh, 914 um, is a, I believe that's the standard issue, non Ryan White HIV, AIDS, and the minority AIDS initiative funding. 15 is a small grant from uh, the, this church, $2,500. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the PrEP coalition is the uh, PrEP is pre exposure prophylaxis because the um, the treatment for HIV AIDS is also a very good preventative. Um, so they're trying to get folks who are not yet positive to take it. Um, 916 is a 16.5 for the ending the HIV epidemic, which is an uh, effort that began out of the mayor's office and with us in Meharry a couple of years ago. Um, because of that, the fact that the Treatment drug is also a very good preventative drug, and there's a there's a way to end that epidemic if we get enough people to take that drug. And 917 is a two-year renewal of the TB program. Drug. Thank you. We have any discussion? Ms. Housen. All right, Council. I uh, am, am curious on the 917. Uh, I did not realize that we still had a tuberculosis situation in Tennessee. Can you elaborate on that or can someone elaborate? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, we, we see a lot of latent tuberculosis, but we also see quite a few active tuberculosis cases. Um, and for those people, you really need to get them off the street and treated um, because it's very contagious and it, they just walk down the street and infect people. So, um, yeah, we, we've We've had a TB program for a long time, uh, and that's two years' worth for that program. I just didn't realize there, there's, there's still TB out there. We see it particularly in, uh, in immigrant populations for a lot of places where it's not as under control as it is in most places in the United States. When I was in the fourth grade, my teacher actually had tuberculosis, and I tested positive. And so for every, it's a wonder I don't glow in the dark. Because back then, that's when x-rays were really strong. And I got x-rays every six weeks for several months. And then it dropped down to every quarter, and then once a year till I was 18. Uh, and I had just been under the false impression that tuberculosis was no longer a big issue. So I was surprised to see. There, there are a lot of folks that a lot of work on what's called directly observed therapy. It used to be that we would actually send a nurse or a person to your house to see you 
take your medicine to make sure that everybody was taking their medicine. It sounds like it's a long course. It's like six months. Um, we so can now do that. Is an issue then? Huh? So compliance is an issue? It can be. You want to make sure people are taking that. Um, so we can now do that remotely. They, it's like sort of, it's a secure version of FaceTime in effect. Uh -huh. And they take it. Uh -huh. So that's, that's cut down the cost for doing it, but we still, still do quite a bit of that. Well, thank you for that explanation. Yeah. I was just kind of surprised because I had a personal relationship with that. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Any additional discussion? All right. Uh, Council Member Hurd, I know that we may have. Do you have any abstentions on these? I have abstentions on 9, 13, 14, 15, and 16. All right. That's where we thought. All right. Thank you. So. All in favor, please say aye. Aye, aye. Yeah. Nay, nay. Uh, any abstentions? And we've got those. All right. So we have 913, 914, 915, and 916. Uh, five in favor, zero against, one abstention. And 917, six in favor, zero against. And thank you. Uh, Ms. Falls, so today, uh, committee, I know I've shared a little information as we've gone through this RFQ process with you, and I've tried to be as transparent as possible of the, of the information that I've received uh, to share to the committee. Um, and in regards, to, in regards to that, I wanted to invite uh, Ms. Falls to come. We uh, concluded the RFQ process yesterday at 4 p.m., um, and so as we move forward, I do, I know you've received some information that have led to some questions and so I wanted uh, uh, Ms. Falls uh, to come and, and help answer some of those questions with us. So Ms. Falls? Yes, thank you. And if you could just give us just a quick background of, of where we are today from you know, the last conversation that you've had with us as a committee. I can't remember exactly where we left it then. So I'm sorry, I know there have been several, but thanks for inviting me. Um, as you know, the RFQ has been on the street for about six and a half weeks. It's longer than is typically done. Uh, we wanted to give everybody an opportunity who might be interested to participate and to know about this. Um, all 330 assisted living facilities in the state of Tennessee were notified by email twice about the RFQ before it was published and then after it was published. Um, there were some expressions of interest in it. Um, there were three parties who had expressed some interest and they those three declined, well, indicated that they would not be uh, bidding. Um, late yesterday afternoon, I think around 2 o'clock, there was a party that bid. I am not privy to who that was or what the contents of, the, of that bid are. Um, Scott Ferguson from Procurement is here, and he can, if you have questions about the procurement process, he can answer those. And Tom Cross from our legal department is here as well if you have questions for them. So that's where we stand right now. Thank you. Uh, committee, do we have any questions? Yes, I'd like to know, were there any restrictions on the eligibility of those who were, um, who could possibly apply? Wait, is this, I mean, am I having deja vu? Did we have this conversation before? Because it really does seem like a conversation we had a few months ago about another facility and, and we thought that this thing was going to come back around to this day and we we're going to be right back at this point. So I have a question about transparency and also about the restrictions uh, on the RFQ. Um, so the answer to your question is, are, are there restrictions? There are not explicit restrictions in the RFQ. There are um, uh, expectations set forth uh, for that um, we're soliciting uh, bidders who have uh, experience providing high quality patient care. So you may call that a restriction. I would call that an expectation of high quality patient care. And then the second is that the uh, bidder be financially, have the financial capability of providing that high quality patient care. So yes, there are um, those expectations set forth in the RFQ and in the uh, contract that's attached as an exhibit to the RFQ. Well, are there any expectations 
um, for the current provider that will exclude them from being able to uh, meet the expectations for the for the RFQ. No one's excluded from bidding. Um, well, you have some qualifications that if they have to have so many years uh, or, or they have to meet a certain financial goal, then that's means of exclusion. I don't think that's actually correct. It, the, for example, I, um, I think the RFQ, if I'm remembering it correctly, says that we, would, we, we are seeking bidders who have 10 years of experience providing high quality patient care. And people can bid who don't have 10 years, but that would be an exception to the, to the RFQ. But they, they're, they're welcome to bid. But what's the likelihood of them being accepted? I mean, if you want them to have 10 years, I mean, it's a deterrent. First of all, I know if someone was looking, if I was looking for a job, and they said you had to have 50 years of experience, I wouldn't apply for it, but I mean, I'd apply for 40. And, and that's certain, I mean, I understand what you're saying. However, this is patients' lives at stake, so it's reasonable in the industry to expect that a, a provider of care to patients would have 10 years of experience in doing that. But if they're providing the care today, and they have been for the past year, would that not qualify them to be able to do it moving forward? I, I, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not one of the people making the decisions about that, whether well, they qualify or not. I to figure that out. I mean, that seems to be common sense to me. Councilmember Hurt, I'm not even sure that they don't have 10 years. I, that, that would be new information for me. I don't know that. So my other question is about transparency. Are we going to receive that? We, everything that we have has been shared with you. Everything has been shared with the chairs of the committees. Councilmember Hurd, I've been chiming with that with the chair's indulgence. Um, we were a, a little taken aback by the Bordeaux experience. And in this case, we have kept Councilman Taylor as health committee chair and Council Lady Porterfield as vice chair for budget because Council Lady Toombs arguably has a professional uh, conflict. And she has understood that and directed us to uh, stay in touch with Council Lady Porterfield. We've been engaging just to let them know we are not getting bids back. We've contacted every provider as Ms. Falls identified. She's even done cold calls just in the county, picking up the phone, hey, would you be interested, and got nothing. She's had two pre-RFK, RFQ, uh, pre-bid meetings just to generate support and buzz. The first one, no one showed up. The second one, she got, I think, three RSCPs and none of them showed up. We're just keeping people apprised, but asking for input and suggestions because the insinuation last time that we didn't try on Bordeaux, we want to make sure the council knows we tried then, we're trying now. We beg for your assistance. If you know of an operator that's willing to run this facility, Bring them on down, because mm -hmm. we're taking any bidders that we can get that are qualified. I know that it's a difficult art in lowering the threshold so much that you get bidders, but without sacrificing quality of care. I know you don't want anybody at Knowles to experience less than optimum care, and that's the challenge we reach. But if you know of anyone, if anyone in this room knows of anyone, if anyone who's watching this camera knows of anyone that would operate it, please send them to us. There is a party that has has bid, so I, I'm I'm a little baffled because it may well be the party you're talking about. Well, you know, all of that sounds really good, and and the only thing I can think of is that uh, my sister's husband was in an assisted living and in, in long-term care, and she decided to bring him home. And they, he had to go back because of emergency surgery. But they told her that she had done much better job taking care of him than they ever did in the hospital that he was in. So I understand 
what it is that you're talking about in terms of having a certain level of care. But it just seems to me that this all seems too coincidental that you've got the same situation happening with Knowles that we had with Bordeaux. And I just believe that there was some, some of this was done by design. And the outcome of it, to me, was predictable. We have solicited all of your help in this from the beginning. And um, if, if there's a stone that we've left unturned, uh, that would be worthy of knowing because we have been very forthright about wanting anyone's assistance on this. Thank you, Ms. Falls. Uh, Councilmember Benedict and Councilmember Walsh, I'll come to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned, Ms. Falls, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned that some, one person or one company has responded to the RFP. Yes. Who is, um, are we able to share that or does the procurement, um, can they speak to, um, the qualifications, at least, of that bidder from an, um, obviously, without having, I believe this came through yesterday, is that correct? It came through yesterday, and I'm not privy to that, and we'll have to let um, Scott Ferguson from procurement respond to that. He's under some limitations in what he took this plus. That's what I thought. I, I figured that that would be. to the process. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I can say is that um, the proposal is, is being reviewed, and the once it's determined uh, what the outcome of the review was is, then we will be able to review more information. It certainly looks like it is a viable option. Or are, you, are you able to I, share I'm that at this point? Okay. All right. Proposal this time. Understood. Um, do you, and so that means that you anticipate that there could be a competitor. Therefore, no, you don't want to release any competitive details. I don't want to. Uh, as per procurement code, I'm not allowed to speak to anything regarding the proposal at this point in time. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Welsh, Vice Chair. Um, Ms. Falls, um, the, uh, the current operator of Noel sent a letter to the, the Chair, which I believe that you were CC'd on, expressing that he felt like the RFQ was designed in a specific way to preclude them from being able to bid. And so I'm wondering if there was something in um, the RFQ to preclude the current operator from continuing on, and what has changed in terms of what our expectations are of the operator from when they were hired and brought on board to run the facility and now? Um, I, um, I actually wouldn't characterize their I didn't read their letter the way you're describing it. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I, I just didn't read it that way. I read that they were deciding that they were not qualified, um, that they were not qualified to bid. So there was nothing, it wasn't designed that way, of course. It was designed to find high quality operators who had the financial resources to, to provide good patient care. And I think um, I, I read it the other way because they are currently operating the facility and they felt like those uh, new requirements were put in there because Metro felt like they couldn't, you know, perhaps meet those requirements. That's not accurate. So has anything changed in terms of what we're looking for in an operator between what they signed on for and what we are looking for now? I wasn't here when they were hired, so I, I, I can't speak to that. Um, I can't speak to what the, what the understanding was. Of course, I, I do know from reading the contracts that when they were engaged, they were, they were intending to move the facility and provide care. They, there was a different vision for the, for the facility. Um, so, but I, I really don't know what, what the understanding was then. Um, can anyone here speak to what might have been changes in the understanding of what the operator originally signed on for and what we're looking for now? Department and I, what, I was here at the time, but I don't remember exactly what was in the previous RFP. That was a near emergency. Yes. We had a we had an operator that uh, had not done a good job and had had you know, unpaid bills, and I think at one point may even have been accused of uh, taking money yes. that belonged to some of the residents there. So that RF, RFQ that led to the hiring of Anthem Care was on a virtual emergency basis. I'm confident that some of the requirements 
uh, that are in the draft contract that went out with this RFQ are more rigorous than those that were used previously. But as Ms. Falls has indicated, all intended to make sure that the, the highest quality of patient care and financial stability is, is paramount. I appreciate that, Mr. Krauss. I guess I, the big, biggest concern that I have is if this new um, bidder that uh, appeared yesterday um, is not a viable bid and um, the current provider is also not a viable bid that we're left with some really um, ugly choices that um, I would prefer that we not have to make and close down the facility or do some other things that might not be optimum for the patients who are being treated there. But I appreciate your response. Thank you. Councilman um, I have spoken with uh, Metro Legal um, and forgive me, Mr. Cross may have already sent the response, but I, I, I haven't had a chance to check it yet. But I did inquire about the legislation that Councilmember Toons brought forth um, that I, my question was if the current provider would be able to continue care if they did not meet the RFQ based upon the legislation that Councilmember Toons previously brought. And Mr. Cross, you may have already responded. My apologies, I haven't had a chance to check it yet. So um, that is something that is being explored. Uh, one concern that I personally have, um, and I, I won't um, advocate for or against the administration or the administration's position. I think you all can advocate for yourselves. I will say that they have uh, kept Council Member Taylor and I aware of the process um, one concern that I have uh, is with regards to if we continue with Anthem Care, if Anthem Care will be the, if, if they are able to provide a safe facility based on information that was provide to, provided to us in March. Um, there was a patient, and I don't, am I allowed to say this? There, so there was a, a, there was a concern about a patient um, who experienced chemical burns. Two patients received chemical burns. One received severe chemical burns. There was a dementia patient who wandered away from the facility and was found deceased the next morning. So the, the facility did not discover this patient for a number of hours. So it's a hard place to be in because I'm, I'm like everyone at this table. We don't want the facility to close down. We also don't want to run a facility that is not providing the level of care that's going to keep people safe. So I have inquired about if Anthem Care doesn't meet the RFQ requirements, can they still continue? I've also inquired about comparing their services to other providers. And if, if their service is comparable to other providers, if, if this is an industry standard and this is how other people are running their facilities, then that's one thing, but if we're saying that the, com that the concerns are egregious and that they're not providing the level of safety needed, then I think we need to figure out as a, a council, as a body, the administration, we need to collectively figure out what the next steps are. And, and I'm 100%, I don't want the facility to close down, 100%. I want us to do everything we can to, to keep the facility but I also want to make sure that we're keeping patients safe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Porkville. So I wonder if there are any other facilities, healthcare facilities, who've had mistakes that patients may have um, accidentally died, or they've accidentally wandered away, or accidentally got too much medicine, or accidentally got the wrong medicine and was it all public was it all publicized you know we have quite a few health care facilities here in this city so i understand we do want the best quality care possible but my concern is is are we providing those possibilities to these um institutions that we already know are lacking um, the, the resources that they need in order to uh, provide the quality of care, of, of the expectation 
of a certain level of care. Councilman Porterfield, then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, um, uh, Councilman Hart. That was my question as well. I wanted a comparison, and I actually spoke with um, Mr. Jamison uh, yesterday, and Ms. Falls, I didn't get a chance to speak with you after budget, but I did present that question on yesterday so that we can get that information. My understanding is that they are the third lowest ranked facility in the state of Tennessee. However, for me, on a scale of zero to 100, that could mean that somebody's a 95, somebody's a 96, and they're a 97, mm -hmm. and maybe everyone else is 98 through 100. So maybe they have excellent care, but they are the third lowest. Mm -hmm. Or that could mean that they are at the bottom and it's problematic. So I've asked for some information so that we can make that comparison so that we can make an informed decision on whatever needs to happen and how we need to proceed. So so to answer your question, I have asked for that information. Right, and I appreciate that because I, I just know Mr. Cross was talking about some of the uh, things that occurred with the previous uh, facility uh, providers and then the, the current providers were acceptable to, to do whatever they did up to this point. But now we're at a point that they're no longer, no longer uh, acceptable, it seems. Councilmember Hauser, I'll come to you after. I had a question for understanding. I'm not sure who would be the proper person to answer it. But when, when you have facilities like this that are private, and you have facilities of this nature that are related to a government entity such as Metro. By being related to a government entity such as Metro, is that like putting some sort of standard, either that we're the bottom of the barrel and come here, or we're middle or top? In other words, when, when we say this is a facility that is you know, under Metro's auspice, does that give it an extra star, or does that say that's a negative and you only put your loved one there if you can't do anything else? And, I, and this is a question, it's not a statement. I just want to know also, as far as liability, if this is a facility that is related to Metro and there is something that happens, such as someone through neglect uh, is injured or dies, does that reflect back on just the operator of that facility or also Metro? So I kind of have two different angles there about the legality, which the lawyers in the room can answer, but then also the perception. And, and what is it that we're saying is Metro? We're, are we saying we got a place to house your folks so you don't have to keep them at home? Or are we saying we are providing some sort of quality care? I think I could probably answer the second question that you asked, which had to do with liability, that we require the operator to have very good insurance that covers Metro and their own potential liability. So it's, it's conceivable that Metro could wind up in some kind of litigation arising from, from an injury or a death at, at the facility, but it's unlikely. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer the, the other question that you posed. Is anyone able to answer your first question? Uh, Councilmember Howes' first question in regards to standard um, versus it being a metro facility. Thank you. Right. Councilmember Hall. I'll, I've got a, a question or a statement, but then I'll connect just with the perception concept. For anybody that's familiar with Metro and the facilities that it has operated, from a perception standpoint, it's always been a negative. And I, I can just tell you, I'm 48, my entire childhood and adult life, it's always been a negative connotation associated with the facilities Metro's operated. Until recently, National General, until recently, Bordeaux Long Term, and with this facility, um, throughout various operators. It's always been a conversation about where they ranked, um, not just from a state standpoint, but in public perception. It, it's As a city, we've always looked at those facilities. It's where you go when you don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and so, just as a city, we've not done the greatest job from a marketing standpoint of you know, building those facilities up or having them presented to the public in, in, in a better way. Um, and then along that same vein, I think it, it behooves us to look at some of those conversations 
from the past with previous facility operators um, in all of our facilities so you can see the difference in not just the standard for private facilities but to answer that specific question this is what the standard has been based on our standard operating procedure with these facilities over the last you know two decades or so and then you can see or elaborate from that what the perception during that time period has been because it's always a two-way street we're very mindful of the operators that we bring in the requirements we put on them but we also need to take a look at now that even though we're moving away from the business model um, the type of operators that come in quite often are a reflection of what we're putting towards those facilities at the end of the day and so um, it's kind of one of those company you keep deals in some instances so I think there's enough information there where you can look at past RFQ conversations you can look at past situations with previous operators to each of our metro controlled facilities and be able to garner that information from that um, I've had conversations and I'm in constant conversation with with the current operators at Knowles um, I would like for them to come and speak directly to that as opposed to me relating those conversations. Um, but to Councilmember Hertz, you know, earlier statement, there is some, some feeling there that after reading the initial RFQ, it's okay, um, we'll just kind of, let's see how this goes, but how we've been operating, what was expected of us, what our communications have been, I think there's somewhat of a little bit of a disconnect because they clearly feel there are some things added this time that not precluded them, but discouraged them. So that takes us back to what Member Porterfield mentioned with the previous legislation that uh, Council Member Toombs had introduced about in the event no one else applied what would we do in an emergency situation and the timetable in which we were under moving forward from that so that we could determine what needed to be done next. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me that background because I, I feel that it is our duty as a council to have a certain standard. I'm not saying gold plates, but a certain standard of how people should be treated. And we as a council and we as a people need to fork up whatever it's going to take budget-wise, to at least have minimal decency care, if, if that is part of it. Ms. Um, I just want to be clear that, the, um, as I've mentioned before, the, for the current operator, it's what's called a blank check contract. There, there are no financial impediments in place that would um, impair the ability to provide high quality patient care at this facility. On the quality side, to respond to Council Member Porterfield's questions, I can, I can describe the, um, on the state of Tennessee, there is, it's called the Healthcare Facilities Licensing Board. They have a website. The website lists all 330 assisted living facilities in the state of Tennessee. Next to each facility, it lists whether there are any disciplinary proceedings that have been uh, occurred against the operator of that facility. Some operators have operated their facilities for 30 or 40 years. Some have operated it for just a few years. In our case, the operator has operated, the current operator has operated it since 2017. So there's a reset in the disciplinary history on the website each time there's a new operator. In this case, um, and I, 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 my recollection is that there are 27 assisted living facilities in Davidson County. N no other facility has um, three, four, three or four disciplinary um, uh, sanctions against them. This facility has five. There are a few facilities, not many, a handful that have one or two. The preponderance have zero. If you look at the state as a whole, all 330 facilities, there is one facility that has seven sanctions against it. Again, that, that's in the history of its operation. 
There's another facility that has six. This facility has five discipline. There's no one who, no entity that has four. There are a, maybe a few, I, I, w I wish I had it right in front of me, that have three. A ha there are some that have maybe 15 have two, maybe 25 have one. There, again, the preponderance don't have any disciplinary hearings. For it to get to that level, it means that there is patient harm that has occurred or the high risk of patient harm and the state steps in to discipline um, either civil monetary penalties or some other type of penalty to um, uh, sanction an operator. So when I, um, Council Member Porterfield, that was in response to your question about when, when we say it's third, it's third from the bottom of 330, it's based on the state's record of disciplinary history. There are only two other facilities in the state with a more severe sanctions against them. And the same is true for Davidson County. There, there are no others in Davidson County. So, so you always get to this point. One second, Councilman Hurd. Councilman Benedict is, in, is next in line for me. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So where there's a will, there's a way. And I don't want to discount any of the work. It sounds like you've done a tremendous amount of hard work. <clears throat> we also are um, going to um, look at a resolution tonight that's going to be many millions of dollars. Now, I'm not suggesting that we would ever want to pay a provider a million dollars a day, but if we wanted and had and prioritized paying a, an operator a million dollars a day, let's just say, are there any of those 330 providers, in your opinion, that would come in and do a great job? for the right amount of compensation. In other words, where there's a will, there's a way. I think that it's about how are we prioritizing things in this city, and taxpayers right now want to understand how are we prioritizing things. My conversations with my constituents over the past week, mainly in regards to Oracle, has been why is this our priority? Why are we doing this, not that? How, why don't we have sidewalks? So, my question becomes, we're able to do some things because we've dug in. And again, I don't want to take away from the fact that it sounds like you've dug deep. But I think that if this was important to the administration enough that we then, then I think we would find some solution. And that might result in a budget request that would require us to pay an operator potentially more than what we're paying today. Um, I, I would like the administration to find a way to, I mean, I, in the RFQ, is there a, a um, I mean, is there a, can we talk, and this is not budget and finance, but let's talk a little bit about the financial side of things, because again, going back to my example, if we had a million dollars a day, would someone respond? And how would we handle that? What, um, at what point is the, the cost outweighing the benefit here for the community? Because this facility provides a needed service to our community and it deserves to be supported as much as other initiatives in the city deserve to be um, um, afforded. I agree. So um, the best example I can give you is this. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes. If, if, you know, if we were to pay someone a million dollars a day, I'm sure there'd be any number who would be happy to step up. Right now, the subsidy um, per patient per month at Knowles is $3,300 per patient per month. That's on top of their existing um, payment sources. So, y yes, that's more, that's more than is um, um, the rack rate at other uh, venue, uh, assisted living facilities that have no disciplinary histories whatsoever. So when I've spoken with some of the other um, operators, not-for-profit, high-quality operators, they have said to, that the, the, um, the subsidy is not an issue, that they, they actually felt it was overly generous for the number of patients who are being served. Why wouldn't somebody want um, 
what what I've been told, I, um, Council Member Hall addressed, and that is it, this has a very difficult history. This facility, and that is a deterrent to other operators stepping in. My question is about accountability. How did we get to this point? If, if, if this is Metro's property, on all of these facilities, why have we not had some accountability to make sure that the sanctions that have been received were not, that we didn't have some steps in place of evaluation and assessment in these facilities throughout the time, if they are metro, if we are caring for them, and I agree, where are our priorities? Uh, is it the fact that we just don't want to be in the business of health care? And if that's the case, then just say it. That's the part about the transparency that, that uh, frustrates me, because it seems like the writing is on the wall, but yet we're still skipping and skirting around it. And, and, and I just don't like to be playing these kinds of games and, and, and pouring my heart and my efforts into trying to create something or make something work and finding solutions when we know what the ultimate outcome is. I'm not sure what the ultimate outcome is because we do have a bid. Okay, well, where is the accountability? What are the assessments and accountability of, of, of checking the boxes and the checks and balances with the facilities that are managed by Metro. I mean, I think that's a really important point. And, and, and those, those have not existed. And I, I think that my, if I could read between the lines when this was privatized, this facility, um, Metro was getting out of the business of providing uh, assisted living um, uh, care. And so it was, the contract was given to a, a for-profit entity. Um, I, and I, a part of what I read between the lines is because we don't have the capacity to do that. And and so so the, 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 an the concern time, we have is... In interest for time, I want to thank uh, two more points, um, questions. I know Councilman Rahal I had a question, and then Councilman Porterfield, and then we'll, and then after Councilman Porterfield, I'll let you respond if there's a need for response, and then we'll we'll move forward and adjourn. You heard a lot of what we needed to hear in the in this process. So look at it this way: when we were just talking about the history, a historical component. When you move legislation that says we're going to intentionally reduce the subsidy, and with the intent of closing these facilities. Every year for the last four or five years, there's been a debate, I know with myself and my predecessor, from that first district seat saying, we have these facilities, we're only paying attention to National General. National General's not getting funded properly or at the level that they want to be, so you know these two small ones in this one district are basically being ignored. Where there is a will, there is a way. It's a history and a perception, not just from the public, but from other entities that may or may not be interested. Board of Long Term went through an exceedingly amount of you know, conversation over years because nobody was interested in taking that facility. It's a reoccurring thing that, that has been with Metro from that standpoint. And so, well, like I said, once you, you take into account from a historical standpoint, you can just go back to 2018, 2017, when this group came in, they walked in with 147 pages of deficiencies and reduced that to zero. You're still going to have incidents, but when you're starting in a hole, it's not operating at an equitable standpoint. You're operating from a hole to get to ground level, and then you try to move forward from that point. And so all of our facilities have this same history, have this same reoccurring theme where they get to a point where they're in a hole, we're struggling to get good operators who, honestly, you're not going to get the best of the best to come into a situation when the facilities are already in the situation they're already in. And I think that's what eventually led to, from a legislative standpoint, saying we're going to start to ease out of this process 
we, we, we're no longer going to be in the business of doing health care. The only reason National General still exists is because it's charter based. If, if it wasn't in the charter, this body or another council would have already done away with it. And we're still going to end up in a conversation with it at some point about just like we did with the fairgrounds. It says you have to have this hospital, but it doesn't say what it has to look like. Right? Isn't that how we went with the fairgrounds? You still got to have a state fair, but if I give you a hay bale, a pony, and a Ferris wheel, that still counts as a state fair. So we're going to end up still having that conversation, but in this one in particular, you have to take in the history, the starting point, and the fact that this has been a constant reoccurring theme. To Member Benedict's point, it's where there's a will, there's a way. We've just never prioritized any of these facilities. It should, we shouldn't even be having the conversation. Chair. Councilman Porterfield. Uh, President Beer. Uh, where will we know if the current bidder qualifies? It'll take approximately 24 to 48 hours to review the proposal. And, uh, we'll have should be shared with uh, Council Member Tyler and myself. It will be available to every, everybody. Can it be sent to the full council body, I guess will be my question, or can it be sent to us so that we can distribute them to the, our respective committees? I don't want to answer a question like that without uh, reviewing it, so I can check on that, and I will have to get back to you tomorrow. Thank you, Chair. Whenever I get it from uh, him, we'll let you know. Thank you. So once once we receive the report uh, in regards to the current bid uh, or the current bidder um, in regards to the qualifications, I'll get that to this to this body, uh, uh, to this chair, uh, to this committee. Excuse me. Um, and of course, I'll ask our, our friends in public and uh, uh, budget and finance to, to send there as well. Um, thank you all, and I will adjourn this meeting.